filled out the survey yesterday. Thank um, you. Really cool. It's like really specific questions. And I think that's really interesting. You get better information when you ask the specific questions. Um, it also gives people a jumping off point to write their own thoughts if you give them a couple specific things to think about. And it was a lot about feelings and a lot about kind of where people are. I mean, it was, it was not, it was a personal, but it felt like it was, we really want to know what the mindset is now. How valuable is that for anyone who looks at this down the line? Uh, it's, it's tremendously important. You can look up information on statistics and data. You can look up uh, how the virus moved through the world. You can, all of that information is going to be available 50 years from now in data banks. What won't be available is those personal experiences. And so to lend the, the specific nature of everybody's experience to the, the global story is, is invaluable. Everyone has a different perspective of this. So the ability to pull all of those in and, and remind the world 50 years from now that we all had a very different view of a global situation, that's going to be really neat to look at. Are there any examples of this kind of effort uh, from the recent or maybe not so recent past in Anoka County that you know of that you've been able to look at responses from? Uh, we as a historical society have done a few other oral history projects uh, with the agriculture and the state hospital specifically. But uh, as far as just a, a survey response, I don't believe anything like that has been done. Have you seen any other, any other groups, large or small, on a, on a wider level or even a smaller level doing anything like this right now also? There's a couple other county historical societies that are doing some uh, like journal projects, uh, going out and asking people to keep journals and, and do those daily entries and submit those. Uh, the Wisconsin Historical Society has a pretty big initiative right now. Minnesota Historical Society has sent out a, a couple surveys and they're, they're trying to figure out how better to tackle the, the state story. Um, you know, from our perspective, we're all working from home. So one of the things that we can do to engage you know, our public and our patrons is to make sure that they still feel heard and connected with each other as a community. Why the question about toilet paper specifically? <laughs> I think when people go back in the newspapers and research this virus, uh, the stories that are going to pop up are, I need a hairdresser and there was no toilet paper. <laughs> so the ridiculousness of that, looking back in hindsight, to know how many paper towels and paper rolls we had in our basements, hoping that we wouldn't get uh, stymied by the virus. Um, there was a little bit of humor involved in the question, but some truth as well. Uh, you know, some people are, are down to six rolls now. Uh, some people have well over 50. <laughs> Nobody's naming names on that one either. So. And are you, when did you first publish it? When did it first go on your website? Um, we've got two phases of the survey out right now. So the first phase we published within a week of the stay at home order. And then the second phase we published at the month anniversary. Um, so the idea of changing the survey after a month, um, we've been getting some very different responses and, and the, the tone of the answers has changed tremendously. Uh, and especially the, was the last question that was just kind of an open ended. What do you think of the impact or something like that? Are you, really surprised by anything that you guys are reading from that? Um, I think what's what's really caught my eye the most is that when we first started, people had a much more optimistic view. Um, it was the start of a little two-week vacation work-at-home tryst that was new and different. And by the time we rounded around to the five and six-week mark, it's getting old. And, and people are really struggling with mental health. They're struggling with the homeschool. They're struggling with, you know, I'm an essential worker and I haven't gotten a break yet. Um, and it's, it's starting to wear down on people. And so the responses are getting shorter. They're getting a little bit more terse. They're getting a little bit more pessimistic. Um, and and it's, you know, it's, it's tough to see. It's tough to read them one after another. How many responses have you gotten all told? 
Uh, over 300 at this point. And from, from what you can tell, a pretty good cross-section of, of people or demographic? Yep, yep. So far it's representing a traditional bell curve where the, the bulk of them are falling in the 45 to 65 range and then it, it falls off either side of that. Um, we've got people who are retired as well as people who are you know teenagers. We've got, um, as of this point, um, more people, there's about 30% of the people that are responding that are at home without work, as opposed to when we first started, it was about 10%. So again, the numbers are shifting a little bit more. So it's, it's an active, ongoing, and not static kind of research project. That's kind of an exciting part of this, even though obviously there's more immediate concerns and you, like everyone else working from home or you know the concerns for your family, but to be able to see this kind of changing and, and evolving right before your eyes, is there a little bit of excitement? Excitement's a strange word to use, but is there a little bit of that for you? Yeah. Yeah, there is. I'll be honest. Um, I'm, I'm trained as a journalist. So to see things changing, you, you know, um, to see things changing as you go and get those responses and, and to see how people are reacting to a situation um, as a, a socio experiment, as a, a bit of psychology, it's, it's fascinating to watch people interact with their community and, and with each other. Um, the news stories, you know, how people are now relating back to what's going on in the world and, and how other people are reacting to it and bringing in the politics a little bit more now. Um, again, that was, that was not what we saw in the, the beginning of the survey as well. You know, people left the politics out of it in the beginning, and now they're, they're starting to bring those in a little bit more heavily. Any way to forecast uh, either how long you will keep it uh, active and live or if you will be making changes to it at any point? I think our plan right now is to put out a new survey each month uh, and just ask questions that are pertinent to what's going on with the world at that particular moment. Um, and then just continue it as long as the COVID-19 is a part of our world. So at this point, that could be years. And will you start to, uh, or have you already make some of the um, results or the answers uh, public so people can watch and, and see that themselves? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're in the process of creating a, a special section of our website at anokacountyhistory.org. Uh, we have one page right now where I've just been uploading comments to it. Uh, it's not curated. It's not organized in any other way other than by date. Um, so we're going to be pulling in columns that we're writing and uh, other longer pieces that people are submitting to us and, and photos. Um, there's a few other documentation projects that people are working on that we can pull in and, and we can create a really nice website package for that. Um, but as of right now, the, the single statements are available on the website. I would just really encourage people to take the time to write down your story, take photos of what's going on, um, you know, any way that you document, have the kids draw pictures, um, you know, what, whatever means something to you, uh, even if it's, you know, holding back a couple um, artifacts, right, things that make the story of this time come alive in a physical aspect, um, you know, and send those over to us at the, the History Center. Um, it, it might seem like something small just to send me a couple sentences about what you did in the day, but in the long scheme of things, it's, it's really imperative. Okay. Rebecca, thanks so much. I, I really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. No, this is wonderful. I appreciate your time so much. Everyone has strong feelings about how to drive, especially merging correctly. I'm here to set the record straight. Hi. I'm Sue Groth, State Traffic Engineer, along with Minnesota State Patrol Lieutenant Eric Roski. We're going to tell you about the zipper merge, the correct, safe, and polite way to merge within construction zones. Merging should always be done carefully, but especially when there's a lane closure caused by road construction or maintenance. So when do we merge if a lane is closed? What is the correct thing to do? The simple answer is, do it when it's safe. Sounds easy. But there's more to know about what we are supposed to do and when to start merging. We need to do the zipper merge. 
This approach will save you a lot of merging confusion when a lane is closed. We're all taught to obey traffic signs and merge when directed to. So naturally, most of us start to merge as soon as we see warning signs and discover which lane is closed. Since we were taught this, it is our mindset that everyone else not merging immediately is wrong or simply being pushy. That's just not true. We can legally continue in either lane until the lane actually ends. Follow the direction of the begin merge sign and take turns at that point. All signs before that are simply warning us of traffic conditions ahead. So doing the zipper merge is really simple. Use both lanes and follow the signs. Obviously, when traffic conditions are light and vehicles are traveling at highway speeds, it's best to merge as soon as safely possible. When traffic is congested, it's actually much safer for us to remain in our current lane until the point where traffic can take turns merging, which is indicated by the begin merge sign. Zipper merge benefits drivers by reducing the difference in speeds between two lanes, reducing the overall length of traffic backups by as much as 40%, reducing congestion on freeway interchanges, creating a sense of fairness and equity that all lanes are moving at the same rate, and reducing incidents of road rage. These benefits allow traffic to move through lane closures safely and efficiently. When there's a lane closed, do the zipper merge. Use both lanes and follow the signs. Easy. Also, motorists who intentionally block traffic trying to use the other lane can be ticketed for impeding traffic. Fines start at $100, so please do the zipper merge and drive safely. On behalf of the Minnesota Department of Transportation, the Minnesota State Patrol, and road construction workers throughout Minnesota, we encourage you to do the zipper merge. Learn more about the zipper merge by visiting dothezippermerge.org. Thanks for your time. And as always, please remember to pay attention, wear your seatbelt, and never drink and drive. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Leah, did you put a new dent in that? This one? No. Were you texting and driving again? Yes. Hi, Leah. Hi, Dad. Sorry about your bumper. <laughs> <laughs> North Metro TV News is your source for local stories. Highlighting the issues in your community, we bring you the news that's closer to home. Join us as we explore the stories all around us, every day at 2.30, 6.30, and 10.30. Hi, I'm North Metro TV News anchor Rusty Ray. And he is six feet tall. Hey, six foot one and three quarters. The reason we bring this up is the current CDC guidelines recommend you keep social distancing of at least six feet between you and anyone else. How far away is that? That's easy. Stay a Rusty Ray away. At work, at the bank, at the grocery store, even at church. Stay, Stay a, a Rusty, Rusty Ray, Ray away. away. You'll be glad you did. Why don't you ever see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're really good at it. <laughs> yeah, I am.